As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on, the gospel of Christ. Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day for all the fathers present and are listening. And it's interesting how some holidays are different. The Father's Day back in Brazil is only in August. So I told Fatima I want two gifts. You know, we can celebrate today and then we can also celebrate from from Brazil, but Mother's Day, it is the same as here. So she only got one gift. Uh, during some messages about finances, one member of the congregation was talking to other person and said, I will be so glad when the pastor quits preaching about money and gets back preaching about the gospel. And people heard him saying that, and someone was telling him, well, it is not our case. We are not going to have a series about finances here from now on. It's just this message that we are touching this. Luke has done a great job last week uh, when he was sharing the needs of the church and sharing how we needed to get engaged in our giving. And he actually briefed a very good sermon just with his three minutes uh, talking here. But when we talk about finances, we are also talking about the gospel. Because the gospel, it touches and it changes every aspect of our lives. When we talk about our finances, we have a different perspective. Because our perspective now, it is totally changed by how we see the Lord Jesus and we are seen by him, by his children and with everything that we do. So when we have here these two chapters of 1 Corinthians, chapter 8 and 9, Paul is talking about this, and he's talking about uh, the church in Corinthians, and we could divide these two chapters in three parts. The first, he is talking about the people that are coming and helping to prepare for the collection of these offerings. The second, he is appealing for the motives and the motivation for that people to be uh, giving and to be reinforced in the way that they are going to be giving. And the third part, which we are going to look more closely today, he is urging people to be generous, to be giving, and to understand that as they are doing that, they are seeding and they are going to reap out of what they seed as well. It's interesting that he starts speaking with them, uh, saying, Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry of the saints. And then he goes on describing the desire of the Corinthians to be giving. But he also talks about the others that have been giving so far. And then he continues uh, on explaining that because in 1 Corinthians 16, he talks with the church and say, as you are used to do in the first Sunday of the month, you are bringing your offerings. So he's not talking with the church about something that is not happening. They had already this uh, habit and this liturgy of giving and donating and giving back in order to bless and to take care of those who are in need and those who needed to be continued to ministry and to serve. It's like he's saying, but one thing I come 
I cannot but set down. The one that seeds sparingly shall reap sparingly. And the one who seeds bountifully shall reap bountifully. Unfortunately, this scripture has been used many times in the wrong way. Like if bringing our offerings and our donations to the Lord is some kind of investment. That God is somehow uh, some kind of Bitcoin magician that whatever you bring here is going to be multiplied for hundreds, for thousands, and for so much more. But it is not like that. We don't look to God as we are doing some kind of investment, but we look to give back, to bring our offerings and our donations with a cheerful heart. And that's what we are going to be looking today, specifically in this verse, the verses from 6 to 15, but I would like just to read from 6 until verse uh, until verse. 7 with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 6 and 7. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he decides and his, in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. For God loves a cheerful giver. When we are talking about finances, we need to understand that as we go giving, it is because we have received from the Lord. It is because we are able to give it back. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. In Deuteronomy 15.10, it says, You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him. In some occasions in the Old Testament, we can see that the people there, they responded to the need so greatly that the leaders of the congregation had to tell them, Stop. It is enough. We don't need you to give anymore. They are going to build the tent of the covenant and, they, and people were called to help with their donations. And the leadership of Israel had to say, it is enough. You don't need to bring it anymore. Because people have the heart to give and they were happy in doing that. It is our hope that as we give, we may do it freely, not being forced or not giving because we expect to receive something in return, but because we are doing it from a generous heart that has learned from the Lord. God wants us to give with a heart that it is not under compulsion, and He wants us to give not with grudging hearts but with happy and freely from what we have received from the Lord. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. The scripture teaches and helps us to understand that it is not the amount of money, of resources, of anything that you are giving back to the Lord. But it is the desire to please and this desire to do it in a way that our hearts are freely giving. When we see the example of this widow, we understand of the happiness that we see in people giving. It doesn't matter which state of life they are. People are giving to the Lord with happiness, and that what it pleases the Lord. Uh, James Dunney, one commentator of the book 
of Corinthians has this sentence saying, God loves a cheerful giver. Money is nothing to him. But as an index to the soul, unless the soul gives it and gives itself with it, he takes no account. When we come to give back to the Lord, we are doing that in a way that we are presenting with happiness, with free freedom that we have. Nothing it is asked for us to do with an obligation. We have the freedom in doing so. Just like that widow that separated whatever she had, that was the most important thing. And God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because giving is trusting. Giving is something that we do when we trust that our lives do not depend of what we produce to ourselves, of what we have stored, of what we manage to save. But we trust that the Lord, it is the one that is going to take care of us. If there is something that we learned during these years working with refugees, it is exactly that. It doesn't matter how much you save, how much you build, how much you have, from day to night, you can just lose everything. And you need to start from zero again. How many times I sat down with people with tears in their eyes, talking about their homes back in their country, and that they have, they have taken like 10, 15, 20 years building that, and now it is destroyed because of the war, because of they cannot be living there anymore. We cannot trust in our capacity of storing and saving, but we need to trust in the Lord with our hearts and with everything that we have. We trust in the Lord bringing it back, and we trust also that whatever we bring back, He can do a lot with that. Just like the disciples when they had that huge crown in front of them and they needed to feed the crown, the disciples came and started talking with Jesus, saying, you better, you know, just let them go because we cannot feed them. And Jesus challenges them, feed them yourselves. And they said, how? We cannot. We need like a half year salary to be able to feed all these people. And that would not even be enough. And one of the disciples brings a boy with his, his little his neck, and, that, and, and John says that he who... John says here that here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fishes. But how far will they go among so many? And Jesus gives thanks. And that very little barley loaves and two small fishes are enough to feed that multitude. In the hands of the Lord, when we bring, he is able to Overflow and multiply. A cheerful giver is also someone that lives a life filled with grace. A cheerful giver has a life filled, has a grace filled life. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. God, it is the one who has freely saved us. And touched us with his grace, with his love. His very nature, it is a giving nature. Grace floods out from his being to the needy and weak sinners. God gives. John 3, 16, a verse that every Christian should know by heart. It says that God gives his son, so we may be saved. He loves the word so much that he gives his son. Love, love from God comes in giving, and giving his son for us, and giving us a new life, and giving us healing, forgiveness, and hope for a better future that we can never imagine. We ourselves have been gifted in a new life in Christ. 
We have been gifted into becoming givers, says Dane Ortland in his commentary also about uh, Corinthians. Grace, the grace that we receive from the Lord, this grace, it is what makes us to be generous and content. We can only be a cheerful giver if we have received God's grace and we have understood what cost this grace had. I was listening to, to one person that came to know the Lord and, and when she talked about grace, she said that before she kind of thought that this kind of religion is just an easy way to do everything you want and still, you know, get away with that. Because what about this grace? Everything is about Jesus has done all. Later she understood that this grace had a cost and the cost was paid by Jesus. But he has gifted us with all that. The real motivation for the followers of Christ in give is not to receive something back, but it is to imitate our Lord. It is to follow the steps of our Father. It is to follow the steps of Jesus, who gave it all for us. The grace of God changes our perspective towards our financial lives. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, Grace of Jesus brings this state of content, of sufficiency. We have enough, so we are able to give it back. But a person that even has a lot, but doesn't have a heart that feels this, this contentment in the Lord, it is never able to give it back because this person always wants some more. Enough is never enough. We that have been touched by the grace of the Lord, we are challenged to live in a way that we live with satisfaction of what we have, but we live giving it back to whom we believe that has blessed us. The lack of generosity refuses to acknowledge that all your assets are not really yours but God's, says Tim Keller in his book, Generous Justice. Finally, as we see here as a cheerful giver, a cheerful giver is someone that lives with an overflowing thankfulness to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. When Paul talks about this, uh, this financial aspect and about the giving with the church, he does not disassociate the, the, the material from the spiritual. But he connects both in saying that the material and the spiritual are together when he refers to Psalms 112.9. And then he says that the seed for sowing is provided for the Lord and increasing the harvest of your righteousness. So giving these seeds are going to bring spiritual blessings. And we see it happening in the life of the church as we go, as we go on reading the New Testament. The divine math of heaven's economy defies our sense of reciprocity. Someone that is generous, he will not reap financially, but he will reap in many different ways that the Lord is going to bless his life. When someone gives, the person who is receiving is blessed, and this person at the end of the giving, the one who is receiving, he starts worshiping the Lord for, for supplying his needs. He is not being material about that, but he is being spiritual in his way of thanking the Lord for everything that he has received and for his faith to be renewed because he can trust in the Lord that he will provide for him. 
In the same way, the person who is giving, he is blessed with this feeling and this understanding and this experience of thanksgiving in his heart deeply because the Lord is doing more and more with what he has done and for him and his family and those who are around him. Giving brings unity as well. When we see that the offering of the Corinthians were going to be blessing the church in Jerusalem, Paul talks in the last verses that uh, they will glorify God because of your submission. And while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. The church of Jerusalem would see the generosity of the Corinthians and the aspects that they had with, between the Jews and the Gentiles. It would be diminished and it would be disappearing because they would be seeing that those that they had suspicious about their faith and how they would be working with Jesus were the ones that were giving in love were the ones that were blessing them in time of need. Giving has a power of bringing unity and helping us to be united and to see each other equally as well. The, the generosity of these Corinthians brought down the suspicious and exitant heart of those in the church of Jerusalem. And that is a very important lesson for us as well. That even though that we do not agree in every single aspect, we still have to give. And to bring to the Lord and to uh, uh, the ministry that we are engaged with, the community that we are serving and being served, we needed to bring because we are bringing to the Lord. It's no excuse to say, I don't like the chairs in blue. I prefer if they were black. Therefore, I'm not going to give to this church anymore. Or I prefer if the pulpit was back there as it was before. I don't want to give anymore in this church because they changed the way that the pulpit looks like. Some of these uh, reasons are presented in every church, but they are not sufficient. Because this is not from a cheerful giver's heart. When we give, we give out of love. When Jesus gives us the, 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 the teaching about loving our neighbor as ourselves, he talks about the good Samaritan that was helping a Jew. And he was providing. Giving is love. His love was not only to see that man and feel pity about him, but his love was translated in actions of taking care of him, cleaning him, putting him on his uh, 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 way to ride, and bringing him to a place, paying the cost of lodging, and saying, if there is anything else when I come back, I will provide. This is love. And again, in Generous Justice, Tim Keller says, we instinctively tend to limit for whom we exert ourselves. We do it for people like us and for people who we like. Jesus will have none of that. By portraying a Samaritan helping a Jew, Jesus could not have found a more forceful way to say that anyone at all in need, regardless of race, politics, class, and religion, is your neighbor. Not, any, not everyone is your brother or sister in faith, but everyone is your neighbor, and you must love your neighbor. When we give in church that runs and blesses others with projects and with their, uh, the, the, the needs that people have, 
We are reaching out for those that we don't even imagine when we give to missions, when we give to projects that are spreading the gospel in different ways. We are showing love. Sometimes it's very difficult to help others to understand how the church operates. Especially in our days that we have a very much kind of a business mentality and an administrative way of doing things also in the church. And many times the donations are saying like, is that going to produce something or give something? And we cannot really calculate those things. When we see, for example, uh, uh, the, the, the Action Refugié Montréal that helps the refugees and the, new, and the people who are in the detention center here in Laval, they provide telephone cards for international call from that people. And that cost. And that may have never, a church that helps in that way may never heard about someone it was benefited with that. But that it is a way of showing love to people that are in need. Because they needed those international cards to call their families and to say, we are alive, we are here. I need my documents. If I don't get this, I will not get out of detention center and so on. And so things like this, churches are engaged around Montreal and all over the world, and we needed to do in order to show the love of God. When we had our diploma validation program back in Brazil, it was very hard to tell donors how, uh, uh, not beneficial, but how it, we would have like a percentage of success in that, because donors want you to act in some projects and have 100% of success in that. But when we were validating the diplomas, the, the maze that you have go through through the universities back there to get someone with their degree validated and back working in his profession was so difficult that we had probably between 60 to 70% of success. Many others would not manage because they didn't have enough documents to prove their knowledge and qualifications. But once you handed that over to that person, you, are not, you were not giving a paper. You were restoring part of the life of that person. And I always try to explain that for donors saying, it is not about how much percent of success we have, it's about of those that we actually manage to help that is important that you give. Church is engaged in such a different variety of projects and things that we do. And we need to give freely, we need to give, to give with grace, and we need also to give with a thankful heart. Giving with joy shows the love of the Lord. And just to finish, as a church, I want us to kind of picture uh, our way of giving like if we are building a trellis to a vine. When you have a vine like that that is growing, it will become heavy and it will need to reinforce its structure. When it's very new and has very little fruits, you just need a small one. And you just need this, this structure to be compatible with the vine and with the weight that it has. But here's the thing, if you don't continue to expand it, if you want this vine to continue to grow and to bear fruits, uh, the harvest can become difficult and the grape bunches may be more prone to diseases and and uh, uh, they will not produce good fruits. For the healthiest grape crop, a sturdy trellis, it is the best way to provide the divine we will be bearing good fruits. As the church grows 
and the church continues to develop our ministry, our mission, what we are called to do and to be, we need to continue to increase and to improve the structure that we have so that fruits will be given and more people will be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to be cheerful givers, but we are called to be cheerful givers full of His grace and with thankfulness in our hearts, looking to what we have as a structure and how we need it to continue to move on, but looking beyond, looking to what kind of shade we can also provide as a church for those who are seeking for a place to come and rest. May the Lord help us. May the Lord guide us. May the Lord change our perspective in every area in aspect of our lives, including in our financial lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you have given us so much. We thank you because you did not you did not expect us to come. You did not expect to give for us to give first, Father. But you came and you gave yourself, Jesus, in our place. And you gave us everything. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we hold dear. We are thankful to you, Lord. And we ask you to help us to have a generous and cheerful heart. We ask you to help us to see our financial life as you want us to see and to practice and to use it in a way that we glorify your name. That every aspect of our financial life may glorify your name. You know we are in need and we have to get better in our financial life here, Father. And we pray for you that is our provider. You are the one who provides the seed. You're the one who provides the bread. You are the one who provides everything. And we pray for each member of this church that their needs may be provided as well. That work, that health, that everything that is needed for them to accomplish and to be able to live with a blessed and prosperous life. We ask you, Father, to bless us and to help us to be like you, generous givers. In Jesus' name, amen.